Good morning, everybody. We don't have quite everybody here yet, but I want you to listen. She's practiced it through a couple of times. You may not know this, but every week, I think it's on Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday, we have some children meeting up here and taking piano lessons. So we're preparing for down the road, and one of them is little Miss Tatum. Tatum's going to come and play for us now. Ready to play Joy to the World for all of us? Not quite yet? Okay, okay. Just thought I'd ask. Let's all stand. Christmas has passed. The Savior's been born. The Messiah is here with us. Let's sing Joy to the World for the Lord has come. Joy to the Lord. The Lord is come. Let us sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the world the savior reigns let men their songs employ what fields and floods rocks hills and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Last verse, he rules the world. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love we have some visitors with us so turn around and tell at least two or three people that you're glad to be in the house of the lord with them today We'll get that fixed. <laughs> Max, come right on. Good morning, everyone. What a joyous season. Like Jimmy said, our Savior's born, and God is good. All right, I have a few things. Uh, uh, one uh, is to remind of the cards in the church mailbox. Uh, pick up your mail, your church mail. Uh, the decorations, the Christmas decorations, uh, and take them down after next Sunday's service. Pick up your decorations after next Sunday's church service. 
uh, have a few uh, other prayer uh, concerns that aren't on the list. I'll, I'll read down through the list. Uh, Vicki Meacham, Fred Jones, Corson, Wanda Beeman, Scott Henry, <coughs> Pastor Don Rogers, family of uh, Tierra Knight, Louis, Louis Scott, Jimmy Hawk, of course, uh, family of Laverne Crossan, school kids during the break, and Ed Thomas and baby Samantha, I need to add to those uh, names, Pam and uh, Reen Haynes are uh, fighting the flu and, uh, and symptoms. Uh, John Gardner uh, should be get some prayers for, I guess he has COVID. Darn it. Greg Kokenauer uh, suffered some from some medical issues, uh, Diana's brother, uh, and Greg Melindy uh, is uh, on a vent, and his, he and his family need need some prayers. Uh, that is, uh, uh, the elders will meet, I guess, after church today. Next Sunday, next Sunday. Okay. All right. That's what I have so far. Uh, Susan's. Got some uh, announcements. Okay, first, we are talking about having a women's Bible study. will be Sunday nights and what, probably six. Yes. And we're, because Steve is going to do something on being able to share your faith. I forgot what it's called. I don't know. Anyway, we haven't really decided what we want to study yet. So if we want, if anybody has anything they really want to do that's on their heart, we're open. Or anyway, we're going to find something. So we're thinking Sunday nights. And the second thing is, we Robin and I are working on a conference. It will be April the 8th, 9th, and 10th. It's a Friday night, Saturday then we leave Branson at noon on Sunday. It's called Women of Joy, and it's I Choose Love Tour. And some of our favorites, Lisa Harper, um, Matthew West will be singing. Anyway, they haven't been conferences since COVID, so this is the first one we could find. And it's $219 a person, and that includes your hotel room. And that's two people per room. We can make it a little bit cheaper, but nobody wants to share a bathroom with four people. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, it's if you are interested, contact Robin or I. Robin probably better because I work. So um, Women of Joy, April 8th, 9th, and 10th, and 219 a person. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. She's never been in a in a living quarters trailer with three other teen ropers sharing a bathroom. That's an experience. <laughs> so I just want to extend a, a huge thank you to those who have been preparing desserts or meals or whatever. Um, and also just remind everyone that we are um, – ministering to around 50 kids every Wednesday from ages pre-K through 12th grade. And although you may not feel led to teach or whatever, um, we could just use people to come up and help prepare food, um, serve food, um, watch kids whenever we're changing classes or whatever. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a need for some help, and we would love for you guys to be involved with it and see what is happening within our youth group. Um, there are, there's a lot of seeds being planted. There's a lot of good things going on. So come be a part of it. Don't think you can't help us in, in some way because there is always a job for somebody if you're willing. So thank you. Last week, I think it was last week, we talked about Ed Thomas and to pray for him. Max brought it up again this morning. <clears throat> Since that time, I got a mail from Ed. Uh, there was a typhoon in the Philippine Islands and did a lot of damage and actually lost one preacher, a preacher named Ronald. I'm probably going to get this wrong. Delorzo was killed in this typhoon. So it's, it's been pretty devastating. Uh, a lot of churches destroyed, the camp 
some of those buildings and things that we supported earlier in the year have been damaged. And, and right now, you know, in this email, it's just like it, it says, where do we start? And they'll start with building the churches because the churches can help other people. So I'm sure the mission teams will, if you, if you would pray for us, but we'll probably be trying to uh, send some funds that way. Uh, and if the congregation wants to do anything extra to help, uh, maybe your taxes are coming up. If you feel compelled, uh, certainly I think uh, mission teams could uh, use some funds for the Philippines. So prayerfully think about that. Thank you. As you remember, on January the 10th, we are going to be serving food at the Compassion Clinic. If you can donate a crock pot of soup or a dessert, if you could please contact one of the mission team members, we would appreciate it. Uh, we, we will get, if you want to bring it to the church, we will get it there. It has to be at the Compassion Clinic no later than 5 o'clock. We will see that it gets there. Um, we are using this as part of our outreach for those people who are donating their time to help those who have no insurance or have no medical resources at all. And if you've never been there, you can go and look around and it will touch your heart. It's a very worthwhile mission. And I realize it's a local one, but there are people who need our help. and. We would like to serve food to those who are um, serving those people. If we don't serve food, then they don't get to eat until they go home at 2 a.m. the next morning. So if you can bring a crock pot of soup or um, a, a, a dessert, if you'll let Loretta, Brett, Crystal, Mike, or me know, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Jaden is at home sick today. She was supposed to um, sing today, and um, Jimmy, thankfully, um, was able to. Looking forward to singing today, um, especially because our family is here. And um, she said, of course, Brett is here, and, and I'm just sick. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, uh, if you'll keep her in her prayers, I appreciate it. God is so good. A lot of concerns. And I, looking out here, all these smiles, there's lots of joys being held back. So I know there's joys out there as well. And I probably should add, uh, you know, sign of prayers to all our families that are still traveling through this season um, for some traveling mercies. Anything else? Please pray with me. Lord, you are God. You are the God that loves us so much that you provided a Savior and deliverance for us. You loved us before we were made. You knitted us together in your image. It's easy to... Uh, to be complacent and, and unappreciative. Lord, right now, I want to give you all the thanks and all the glory and all the praise. I want to lift up these concerns mentioned to people uh, in health, in bad health, in a bad way. hope they feel the, our heartfelt prayer for their healing and their well-being, physical and spiritual. Right now, Lord, I lift up the, the unsaid prayers. You know the hairs on our head. You know our needs before we come to you with them. I pray right now that ministered to through you, your son, the Holy Spirit.
Spirit. I want to thank you for the rain that you sent and, Lord, that the rain that you're sending. We know your land is dry. It's yours. It's all yours, Lord. We're just doing the best job we can to, to steward it. Because this congregation is just so mightily does to give and give back and reach outside these church walls. We welcome you into our worship today. Where two or more together, you say that you are there with us. And right now I feel your presence. As we join together our voices in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Got here this morning again and knew that I was going to be filling in for Jaden. And he, Robin sent me these songs. I'm like, that one's not even in the book. She threw one of those curves on us. But we got it all covered. Loretta brought it. Got the music. It's a song we all know, but let's do our best to sing. Do you hear what I hear? Said the night wind to the little lamb, Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb, Do you see what I see a star a star dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite with a tail as big as a kite said the little lamb to the shepherd boy do you Hear what I hear, ringing through the sky, shepherd boy. Do you hear what I hear, a song, a song, high above the trees with a voice as big as the sea. With a voice as big as the sea. Said the shepherd boy to the mighty king, Do you know what I know? In your palace warm, mighty king, Do you know what I know? A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Said the child to the people everywhere, Do you do what I say? Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. The child, the child, sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and light. He will bring us goodness and light. people said? Amen. Amen. Children, you may be dismissed to Children's Church.
And as the wise men went to see baby Jesus, they brought salt, wine, and a goat. It's not what the Bible says. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh because they were special gifts. Gold has always been a symbol of wealth. Frankincense is an aromatic gum resin. It is scraped from the bark of a tree, and it was, it was pretty delicate. And myrrh is sat from a tree native to the Near East, which was also a, a fairly hard item to find. As my very, something I always go to, Google, to find the value of these, I was kind of curious what, what the meaning of frankincense and myrrh were, why, why that was included, because we all know gold has always kind of been the symbol of, of, of wealth. It said in there that frankincense and myrrh were worth four to five times what gold was back then. So that just kind of symbolizes the importance and the significance of these gifts. So as we give, let's not give the ordinary gift, let's give a special one. Let's sing, O Come All You Faithful, as we take up this morning's offering. Doxology, please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these gifts, Lord. Help us to uh, further your kingdom with them, Lord. Help us to be the guiding light to others and uh, help us to uh, be the ones that you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lying in the cradle within a stable is the first gift of Christmas, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Over the next 33 years, much will happen, leading from the stable to that table at the, upon which the Last Supper was served. On the front of the communion table, there usually found the words, This do in remembrance of me. When we come to observe this ordinance, it should be a time of remembrance of the difference Christ made, past, present, and in future, so that we may remember. What's a Christmas carol you'd like to sing, Acapella? <laughs> Silent Night. We, somebody missed that. For uh, Some of you did for the Christmas Eve service. But let's sing it and think about the Silent Night, that holy night. Silent night, holy night, all is calm. Go ahead and come up. Holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in
this day and we thank you for the birth of your son for us that we're able to celebrate life as we do Lord. We ask you to bless those that cannot be here today, those that are sick and hurting Lord, that you just know what we want and need to do. We ask you to bless these women and nurse them to their bodies Lord and ask that as we go places through the week that we'll have the actions that will show you that you're alive and well.
some of you heard this Christmas Eve service. Philip's the one that brought this to our attention. And just a little thought that I just had during that communion meditation was that little church down there. We tried to set up some things here that shine the light here tonight during our Christmas Eve service. But if you've never looked inside the doors of that church, it's, it's pretty cool. There's a pulpit in there, and there's pews in there. Of course, I don't know why Charles Bamberg didn't put people in there. Maybe it's a message for each one of us. And this song kind of goes, it, it's touched my heart. we I'd never heard it before. We just sang, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful. But listen to the words of this song, and we all fall in this category also. And with the new year coming, may we find ourselves more faithful. But this song is entitled, Oh, Come All Ye Unfaithful. Yes. I just wanted to get a feel of what the microphone sounded like. of his perfect love. Oh, come, guilty and hiding once, there is no need to run. See what your God Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born. 
Christ is born for you. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. Good morning. It's good to be here today. Uh, the Sunday following Christmas is always a somewhat peculiar uh, Sunday. It's not quite the new year, and uh, Christmas has already passed. So it is good to see every one of you here. I want to take you this morning on a journey way back into the Old Testament to the life of the prophet Elijah. Elijah was the most dynamic of all the Old Testament prophets. Uh, his life began like a meteor at night that suddenly appears and suddenly disappears. Uh, he suddenly appears in the court of King Ahab and pronounces there is not going to be any more rain until I say so, and then he disappears out into the wilderness. Uh, he hides out at a brook, and he is fed by ravens until the brook dries up. And then he goes to another country, Zarephath, and there he stays with a widow lady and does a miracle before her. And then at the end of two years, he comes back and sends a message uh, to King Ahab, and he says, I'm going to let it rain. Meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring with me all 450 prophets of Baal and all the other false prophets, and we're going to have a spiritual contest to find out who is really God in Israel. So the prophets of Baal assembled on Mount Carmel, and Elijah said, You all prepare an altar and put a bull on it, but don't light the fire. And you pray that your God will light the fire on your sacrifice. And if your God lights the fire on your sacrifice, then your God is God. And I will build an altar, and I will put a sacrifice on mine, and I'll pray to my God, and what, whoever God wins, that will be God. So the 400 and prophets, 450 prophets of Baal went first because they were the more numerous and they started praying to their God. And they started praying at noon and they started praying uh, uh, and they prayed and they prayed and they danced and they yelled and they did all sorts of incantations and they cut themselves with knives thinking that blood would get the attention of their God. And uh, then pretty soon Elijah started mocking them. He said, pray louder. Maybe your God is asleep. <laughs> and I can just hear them just uh, real, the difficult uh, rises. And then he says, dance faster. Maybe your God is too slow. Cut yourself some more. Maybe your God would be impressed with a little bit more blood. And Elijah started mocking them. And there was no fire that fell from heaven. And that's where we take up the scripture in 1 Kings chapter 18. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in ruins. 
And that's the phrase I want you to remember because that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Repairing the altar of the Lord that was in ruins. How many of you have a broken altar? And you need to repair the broken altar. How many of you have let the altar fall into ruins, into decay, into disrepair? And why does that happen and how does that happen? He repaired the altar of the Lord which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around it, deep enough to hold several gallons of water. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid the bull on the wood, laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour the offering, pour the water on the offering and on the wood. So they took four large jars and they wet the altar. They wet the sacrifice. Then he said, do it again. So they took the four large jars, refilled them, and poured it on the altar again. And then he said, do it a third time. So they took the four jars of water, and they poured it on the altar, poured it on the sacrifice again. And then at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me so that all these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the soil and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Altars that should have been used, but they weren't. Altars where we should have worshipped, but we didn't. Altars that should have been used, but they're in disrepair. Oh, Father God, we pray that you would bring down the fire from heaven into our hearts and make our hearts burn once again. I pray that you would Consume the altar. Consume the sacrifice. Lord, help us to repair the altar that has been fallen into disuse. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. He repaired the altar of the Lord. That's the legacy of Elijah. By the way, he is a person who lived but has no grave. To move on to the end of the story, he ascends to heaven in a chariot of fire, never dies, is never buried. Parenthetically, in the book of Revelation, in the end days, you have two, two witnesses who come back to proclaim the holiness of God. 
There's only two people in the Bible that lived and never died. That's Enoch and Elijah. And many scholars speculate that the two witnesses that suddenly appear in the, the book of Revelation are Enoch and Elijah come back to proclaim the holiness of God, to call the people to repentance. And then in the book of Revelation, the two witnesses are killed because it is appointed unto a man once to die. And after that, the judgment. So Elijah lived but never died. But it could well be that we will see that death happen in the book of Revelation. That's another story in the prophecy. We're not going there this morning, okay? Just to kind of whet your appetite and make you kind of excited about the things of God. But what is an altar? A law, an altar is a symbol of a people's religion. It is the symbol of their worship of God. It is not really the altar, but it is the hearts of the people that are worshiping at the altar that really matter. An altar is a symbol. Number two, an altar is a place of appointment. It is a meeting place. It's as if God says, I will meet you at the altar. I just have to stop. You know, churches used to have an altar at the front. How many of you know that? There was a time when people would come to the altar in a worship service. And there, was in, there used to be in church what was called a mourning bench. It was kind of like the altar where people would come to the front in a worship service and they would fall on their knees and they would pray to the God of heaven and they would confess and they would repent and their hearts would be changed and they would cry over the sins in their own life as they rededicated themselves to God. An altar is a place of appointment where God says, I will meet you there. Number three, an altar is a place of worship. The place where you come into the presence of God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God that was set in front of the altar where the fire had fallen. An altar is a place of sacrifice. What have you really sacrificed for God this last year? Most of us give to God out of our abundance, but never sacrifice. We give God out of the excess. If we don't need it for something else, well, then we will give a little bit to God. Kind of like crumbs from the table. But an altar is a place of Sacrifice. An altar is a place of consecration where your heart is turned back to God. I wonder if a broken altar is what needs to be repaired today as we say, as we face a brand new year. We need to come before the God of heaven. We ask for the fire to fall. We need to wet the altar with tears, with prayers, and re-consecrate ourselves to God. These people of Israel, they were a people with a ruined altar. Their altar had fallen into disrepair. I don't know where the altar came from, but up there on Mount Carmel, there was an altar that had been built to God. Somebody wanted it. Somebody needed it. Somebody built it. And then time passed and it was forgotten. People quit going up on the mountain to the altar. And then a few weeds started growing up. And then a few briars and a few bushes. And then the erosion of time occurred and the, altar, the stones of the altar started falling down. And then pretty soon you couldn't hardly tell it was an altar at all because it had not been used. It had been abandoned. No prayers offered at the altar. 
No worship at the altar. It's a sad picture, isn't it? What causes an altar to fall into disrepair? Well, there's a hint in the next chapter, in chapter 19, verse 10, when Elijah said, The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They have broken down your altars. Sabotage can destroy an altar. When somebody comes and deliberately destroys that which has been erected for the honor of God. And we have a few things that sabotage our faith, that deliberately, intentionally destroy our faith. I'm just going to mention in passing and briefly the doctrine of evolution. That destroys people's faith in God. To believe that you, you, that you just came from no place, with no purpose, with no plan, with no intelligence, that you just suddenly happened over time plus chance and suddenly you're here. You came from no place. You have no value. You have no purpose. That's what people are being taught today. And that destroys faith. Now I have to clarify terms. There is a truth to evolution if you think of evolution as change. Because things do change. If I was breeding dogs, I can breed little dogs and I can breed big dogs. I can, bring sh I can breed long-haired dogs and I can breed short-haired dogs. I can breed white dogs and black dogs and yellow dogs. I can breed mean dogs and puppy and kind dogs. I can breed all kinds of dogs, but I cannot breed a dog into a duck. Many evolution, microevolution, is change within a species. And we believe in that. But macroevolution is that all species came from previously existing species. There is not one single evidence in all the world of one species becoming another species. Macroevolution does not happen. Never has. In the, book of Revel in the book of Genesis, God said, let them breed after their kind. And that is still true. Always has been true. Always will be true. Macroevolution taught as a faith, not as a science, as a faith, sabotages the altar of God. But maybe more to the point for us this morning, I believe disuse destroys the altar of God. When we just quit going to the altar, when we just say that let the altar be and we just don't go and we don't worship and we don't pray, that destroys the altar. Decay from neglect. Erosion of time. That's what destroys the altar of God. Back in the Old Testament, these people had left the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the God of their forefathers. But they were no longer worshiping that God. They had started worshiping the Baals. How many of you have Christian parents? You had a believing mother. You had a believing grandmother. A believing grandfather. I want to ask you this one. Do you have the same level of faith in your life that your grandmother had in hers? He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in ruin. Oh, my friends, as we look toward 2022, I think we need to work on the altar. How do you repair an altar? There's some hints here. In 1 Kings chapter 18, where we read the text, 
when King Ahab came to Elijah. King Ahab said, Elijah, you are the troubler of Israel. You're the one that caused this drought to happen. And Elijah said, I have not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have because you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. When you abandon the commands of God, you destroy the altar of God. What commands can you think of that you just kind of let fall into disabuse, disabuse and disrepair in your life? How about this one? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. When you treat Sunday as a common day instead of a holy day, you are destroying the altar. God. I guess I could stop and preach on that, but I won't. I'll go on. How about this one? Bring ye all the tithes into my storehouse, and prove me now herewith, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not be capable of receiving. Are you current on your tithing as you end 2021? Or do you need to write a large check and say, oh God, I've, me I've messed up. I've been, I've been, all that you've been giving me, the goodness of God, I've been using it for me and for my family and for our pleasure, and I haven't been making you God over my finances. You have abandoned my command. Daily time in the Word, I like that. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How many of you would like to be stronger in the Lord? Let me tell you this. There is no way to be stronger in the Lord without spending time in the word of God. There is no alternative path. There is no substitute. If you want to be close to God, you must. Spend time in the Word of God. Like newborn babies, devour the sincere milk of the Word so that you may grow thereby. Without the Word of God in your life, you're just going to stay a baby. And listening once a week to a preacher preach a sermon is not a substitute for your personal time in the Word of God. Thank you. Thank you. You have abandoned the commands of God. You see, King Ahab thought drought was his problem. But Elijah had spiritual insight, and he saw it was not drought, it was devotion that was your real problem. Number two, Elijah said to the people that were assembled, he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. In other words, there's a time for spiritual confrontation. Oh, I heard, my dad was a preacher, but he never went to Bible college. And sometimes his home upbringing would come out of his mouth and it just came to me. Forgive me if I sound so plain. He would say, piddle or get off the pot. If God is God, serve him. If he's not God, then become materialist and become a humanist and just immerse yourself in the world. But make up your mind. Don't be wishy-washy. Somebody said, I've never seen a person straddling the fence that got off on the right side. Another place in the Bible, let's say, now where is it? He says, in the book of Revelation, because you are you know, lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Even God hates a lukewarm Christian. If God is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, then follow him. But make up your mind. 
That will repair an altar. That will repair an altar. Then you know it says that when Elijah was repairing the altar, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended to Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with those 12 stones, he built up the altar. The altar was built out of the stones that represented the people of God. In other words, Elijah was saying this. You remember when you were baptized? You made a pledge. I believe that Jesus Christ is the anointed of God and I accept Him as my Savior and Lord and I'm going to live with Him for the rest of my life. Do you remember when you did that? Is it still important to you? Are you still living it? Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. You are a Christian. You belong to God. You are God's person. Don't forget it. Remember who you are. You are the people of God. You have been called by God. You've been anointed by God. You were saved. Don't forget it. A spiritual identity remembered and affirmed will rebuild the altar of God. One of the most important things in this, Jimmy, I know you you like this, uh, the four water jars, pour them on the altar, Do it again, pouring it on the altar. Do it again the third time, pouring it on the altar. Remember, this was a drought. It hadn't rained for two years, and water was precious. And he's taking large amounts of water and pouring it on the altar. There's a sacrifice involved. There's a sacrifice involved. There's a cost involved. Pay the price. Pay the price. I can't help but equate the water on the wood with tears and with prayer. Can I say it this way? Praying with tears. Not dry, shallow tears, prayers. The heartfelt, heart rending prayers. when you kneel in the presence of a holy God and you ask for Him to touch you and heal you and cleanse you. And they come from deep in your soul. That will repair an altar. The fire will fall when the wood is wet. When we wet the wood with our tears, with heartfelt, fervent prayer, then you'll find the presence and the power of God. I want to close by taking you to the opposite side of the Bible, to the book of Hebrews. In chapter 13, The author of Hebrews says, We have an altar from which those who give the sacrifices have no right to partake. And if you read Hebrews, the altar is really the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the altar. When you come to the cross, the place of sacrifice, and you take up your cross and join your cross with His cross, Have you remembered the cross lately? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. cross is not something that is forced upon you. A cross is something that you take up willingly, that you carry for yourself. We have an altar. Our altar is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to go to the cross. And we need to kneel at the cross. And we need to pray 
to the Christ of Calvary, praying with tears until we feel the presence and the power and the cleansing of God. And that's what I pray for you for in the year 2022. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in disrepair. What can we do as a church, as a people, to be really serious about God? What do you need to do? What change do you need to make? Father, we have an altar. It is the cross of Christ and we need to go to the cross and kneel there before the cross and surrender our hearts once again. Father, this morning I pray that you would allow us to rededicate ourselves to you. To repair the altar of the Lord that has been broken down and make Jesus once again Lord of our life. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, we're going to sing an invitation in just a moment. I just feel like somebody this morning needs to come forward and say, pray for me. As I enter 2022, I want to be a better Christian. I want to rededicate myself. I want to matter more for God. Would you make that decision as we stand together and as we sing? Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling his tent really calling today before we sing the next one I'm going to stop you because if I wasn't up here I would probably be down there you're going to laugh at something that I need to give give up Lisa back here Kirk could probably tell you what it is and again you can laugh at it but I know I have been struggling with it Beth has heard me so many times say I need to get quit this you think it's something simple? I can't give it up. It's Dr. Pepper. <laughs> but you know what it's doing? It's making me somebody that I shouldn't be. It makes me sluggish. And talking about going to the scriptures, if I went to the scripture as much as I thought it was Dr. Pepper time, I would probably be standing in Philip's shoes. So I know there's more that God wants me to do. So I need accountability. And before we sing the next verse, Philip wasn't there. But there's some men, and there's a lot of them here because they've been faithful to a Bible study and thankful Steve felt led to lead it. But if you were one of those people, one of those men that were all striving to become more like kingdom men, I ask you that you come and we pray together. Because each one of us, we wouldn't have been at that Bible study if we didn't want every single one of our breaths and our next step to be closer and, and more near to him to help this church that we serve in. So I'm going to ask you to come as we sing the second verse, and Phil will pray for all of us and as a church. But I do, I'm serious about me coming to say this. I can't judge anybody about their cigarettes or their drinking and alcohol or whatever because I can't give up stinking Dr. Pepper. And it's, it's not allowing me to be the Christian that I need to be. And I want to be closer to him with every step and every breath. So we need to come <clears throat> do what? I'm going to now because you call me Billy every day and ask, you had one of them stinking Dr. Peppers yet? Let's sing the second verse. Jesus is calling the weary to rest. 
Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him your burden and you shall be blessed. He will not turn you away. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, tenderly calling today. Father, I thank you for these men who have been questing for you and for your presence, wanting to know you better and wanting you to, to know and to understand your will for them and for this church. Father, I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would anoint them with your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would uh, burn away anything in their life that is separating them from you so that they can be consecrated to you. Father, I pray that their leadership over a Dover Christian church would be, would be dynamic, that they can be used by you to change this church, become a more holy, a more empowered place where people can come and find Jesus Christ as Savior. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.